welcome to this Facebook Live um, on this um, Friday morning. Um, today joining me is Dr. Clayton Chow. He's the Regional Executive Medical Director of Providence St. Joseph Health here in uh, California. And Cheryl Eskin, who is the Program Director of Teen Line. And so I wanna give both of them just a moment and a chance to introduce themselves a little more fully to those of you that are watching so that you know who it is we're talking with. So Dr. Chow, you wanna tell us just a little bit about yourself and what it, what it is that you do and why you're here today about why this matters to you. Good morning, Kay. Good morning, Cheryl, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Clayton Chow. I'm the Regional Executive Medical Director uh, for uh, Mental Health for Province St. Joseph's Health System uh, in Southern California. Uh, basically, uh, we, we are uh, putting mental health at the forefront of our health system and, and trying to uh, create a community coalitions working with other partners, a uh, partner like yourself, Kay, in the faith-based community uh, to really elevate the importance of mental health uh, as the uh, overall health for the community. Uh, today's particularly is important, even though I'm a psychiatrist uh, a provider, but I, I am uh, someone who living with depressions and PTSD and actually a survivor of suicide. And also uh, I have family member who died by suicide. So this is very close to my heart. So thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Just thank you for for sharing. You know, I um, the last time we talked, you were very open about um, your own lived experience, both personally and in your family. And as hard as that is to hear, because I think every one of us um, who listens to that feels great empathy and compassion, and our our hearts are moved. And it's hard to talk about. It's it's hard to talk about, but just the fact that you are, are sharing um, in such a way actually removes stigma and makes it easier for other people to tell their story. So thank you so much for being with us today. And then thank Cheryl, um, tell us just a little bit about yourself and, and um, the, what it is that you do for a living that then brings you to this conversation today about 13 Reasons Why, the Netflix show, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But just tell us about yourself. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me today, and, um, and hello to Dr. Chow as well. I'm Cheryl Eskin. I'm the program director of Teen Line, <clears throat> and Teen Line is what it sounds like, a teen-to-teen -teen hotline. We started in 1980 based on the premise that when teens are struggling, they turn to each other a lot more than they turn to the adults in their lives. So in 1980, we started as a hotline where teens could call to talk about whatever was on their mind. And as technology's evolved, we do text, we do email, we have a message board, we now have an app, and we still have our hotline as well. So we have a lot of resources or access for teens to reach out if they're struggling. And we say with anything, people think of us as a crisis or a suicide line, but we're really there for anything that a teen is struggling with. And with social media and with the availability of just access, we hear from teens all over the world now, which is really amazing to us. And we've really seen teen angst is teen angst is teen angst, no matter where you live. There's certain, obviously, geographical norms, cultural norm, um, cultural differences, but a lot of the same themes are coming through. So we're really glad to be a part of that. Um, we train about 100 teens, about 60 teens a year to be on our hotline talking to their peers. Wow. And it's a really, really powerful experience. A um, little bit for background, I started as a teen line listener when I was 14. Oh, yeah. wow. And then obviously grew up, went to you know college, grad school. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And I spent my career working with adolescents. So it's really fun and rewarding for me to be back on the other side. Teen Line and myself really passionate about decreasing the stigma around mental illness, opening the conversations. We do a lot of outreach to schools and communities about why people would reach out to us and just demystifying some of these things and helping teens feel like they're not alone. And for me personally, I do a lot of parent education as well, because I think even the best and well-intentioned and well-educated parents don't always know what to look for in their teens. So we're really passionate about providing that, tools for better communication with their teen, demystifying adolescents, and knowing the warning signs as well. So um, it's a little bit about background. Our website is teenlineonline.org. Um, a teen in your life who needs some resources or help. There's also a parent site 
as well. And um, 13 Reasons Why definitely rattled us last year and um, definitely happy to talk about that and excited to talk more about this series today. Yeah, let's do that. well, I think probably any parent who's watching is like, okay, so Cheryl, can you give me your um, your mobile number, please? Because yeah. I want to talk to you as soon as it's over. Uh, and you, I think you hit one thing you nailed for me just as a mom who had um, a son with a severe mental illness is um, so often I just didn't know what to do or where to turn. And I didn't know who could help. And just even the things that you're saying, I didn't know about Teen Line. It's a new, um, this is an organization that's new to me. So um, I'm so excited that you're with us and I'm so excited for the work that you do and uh, can't wait for this conversation. So let's kind of jump into it. We, we just briefly mentioned um, the, the show, the Netflix show, 13 Reasons. And I imagine most of the, those that are tuning in know something about it already. And that's why they're, they're watching or listening today. But give us just a, one of you, just give us a, or both of you, give us a brief overview of the show. Um, you know, I'll kind of tell you my thoughts about it afterwards, but just give us an overview in case somebody is just learning um, about uh, 13 Reasons, doesn't really know much about it. Um, Dr. Chow, do you want to start or Cheryl? It doesn't matter to me, whichever of you. Sure. So um, 13 Reasons Why uh, is a show uh, surrounding about um, a death uh, by suicide of a student. Uh, and it's more like a flashback. Each episode has a character, uh, a people in her life that looking back and what happened or led up to the, 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 the suicide. Dr. Chow, can I ask you to speak up just a little yes. bit? Sorry. That's okay. Just uh, want to make sure everybody can hear those rich pearls of wisdom that you're dropping oh, there. You're so kind. Uh, I was just saying that uh, 13 Reason Why, for those of you who have not seen it, uh, is a show uh, sort of like a, a, um, a flashback or uh, event around uh, the the life of people uh, who uh, connected to a youngster uh, who died by uh, suicide, um, and and I think uh, season two is continuations of all the event that led up to that uh, in people uh, in her life. Cheryl, is there anything you would you would uh, add to that? that show? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Cheryl. Yeah, I think um, obviously uh, Dr. Chow did a great job. I think one of the things it was, it took us a, a lot of us by surprise, 13 Reasons Why. It was released um, as a, obviously as a series. So a lot of teens binge watch it in the course of a weekend before I think the adults and the professionals had a chance to really get on top of it. And it quickly became the most streamed show in Netflix history. And at least from our end, it dealt with, like as Dr. Chow said, it was a girl who took her own life and left behind tapes, kind of telling the story. It dealt with a lot of tough themes, sexual assault, uh, drug abuse, suicide. And in my opinion, didn't do the best job giving resources, giving hope. There's a lot of graphic imagery in there. And so it really, from my perspective, rattled a lot of the community, particularly kids who were struggling as well. Um, some of my concerns, it glamorized suicide in some ways and just left you with images that were hard with hard to see. I'm sure we'll get into this more, but the adults and the counselors in this show were not portrayed very well. And so it, to me, it didn't leave a lot of hope there. And that was what was definitely we'll alarming. Come back, we'll come back to some of um, that. Yeah, I went point. ahead there, so. No, that's okay. No, no, the idea, but but that those things that you were mentioning just at the end about how the adults um, maybe missed some opportunity to, to help this particular student. But um, I was telling Dr. Chow um, offline before we started, I just sort of counted through some of the um, some of the topics that that I saw that were covered in last season and then season two, what we didn't say is that season two, I mean, I don't think we said this, We, but season two um, is available today. And that's why we're having this conversation is um, not only was it the most, uh, you know, received the highest ratings last year for Netflix, so much so that they renewed it for season two. But the themes that that I saw was um, just to even amplify what you said, Cheryl, gra one graphic suicide, an mm -hmm. attempted suicide where a student um, shoots himself. There are two graphic rapes that are portrayed. Um, Self-harm, a student, um, an adult um, who struggles, struggles with substance use disorder. There's domestic violence uh, where a student is assaulted by uh, his mother's boyfriend. 
Um, there's an, an accidental, a car accident where a student dies. And as a result of another student's negligence, there's complex grieving following the suicide of the main character, Hannah. Um, there's gun violence. Um, you know, we, we see one student uh, carrying a gun and then we see a picture of an assault weapon. And then in season two opening, it looks in the, at least the um, credits, it, it shows uh, another main student shooting a gun. We don't really know what that's about. I mean, sexting. There's the topics that are covered in 13 Reasons Why are themes that, of course, all the students in our lives are facing in one way or the other. This is a complex world we live in, terrible things that our students are being a part of and asked to witness. But for me, um, you know, I have a mostly negative reaction to the series. Having lost a child to suicide, there are parts of it I, I, I can't watch. I read the book and watched um, a little bit of last year, but I did not watch um, the, 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 the suicide episode. I just was so triggering to me. And I just uh, know that there are lots of others who are vulnerable and it's, it's very triggering to them. But I think for me, as I come down on it, it's that there are so many, uh, oh, heart-wrenching and, and topics, and they're, they're handled in a very heavy-handed way. Mm -hmm. I think maybe the intentions were good to start conversations and help, but for me, it ends up um, being a very heavy-handed approach. So Dr. Chow, um, what's the likelihood that students, if I say don't watch this, are gonna pay any attention mm -hmm. to that? So, so, so for, first of all, I, I'm so glad that you read up all those themes for season two. Actually, um, the, 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 the producer, the, the show, people who make the show was, is a clever way of identifying those are the risk factors that bring about suicide. Because it, it, suicide is not simple. It's not just one thing and then people... Right just decided to uh, uh, take their life, right? It's a complex uh, uh, condition. Uh, if you think of suicidology as a condition, and, and, and the important piece is that those are all the risk factor that would lead someone um, to attempt. Um, from a suicide, su survivor point of view, it was very difficult for me to watch as well. And, and while I was watching it, clearly it, it brought back some triggers, um, but, um, I was in therapy, so I was able to process it with my therapist. So my hope would be um, youth or anyone should not watch it alone, right? You brought up telling you not to watch um, is not going to happen. It's almost as if telling kid, don't put your hand in the cookie jar, right? Because it's, there's so much hype about this. Everybody yeah. talks about it. Even yeah. the youngsters are talking about it. So my my advice would be, uh, parents or adults, please watch it with your child, especially if you know your child have some anxiety or have some or are at risk uh, of of of, of uh, uh, thinking about uh, attempting a suicide. Right? Those are the risk factor. If if you, if your child and your family live in those environment, um, it should be a signaling for you that okay, there's no way your child's not going to watch or your youngster's not going to watch. Um, you need to watch with them and then process, have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, seek help. And sure. and then, so I, I think we would probably, Cheryl, do you, you feel that same way that telling, you know, telling a student that um, particularly, you know, high school, college, you know, that you recommend they not watch it or that you would prefer that they not watch or whatever, you know, that they may or may not pay any attention to that. If they're a younger child, you might have more control over the, um, the media they consume. But um, just you feel kind of that same way that it's probably inevitable that a lot of students are going to end up watching it. And therefore, you know, there's some conversations we need to have. Definitely, 100%. I think the younger, like the late elementary, middle school kids, we have more of a chance of shielding it from it. But even if they're not watching it, their peers are potentially watching it and talking about it as well. So I really don't think as a parent, we can think that our child doesn't know about this or hasn't heard about these topics. So I think it's important to talk about these things. And just adding to what Dr. Chow said is that this show is a fictional story of what happens. This is not necessarily a real account. I think that's the hard part with, it's a real account in the sense of all the risk factors and all the things that happen in high school. But I think um, what is dangerous, teens don't always, know the difference between reality and TV. I mean, they do on some level, but um, 
not in the same way. And when they see, you know, in my mind, suicide is permanent. And obviously people have different views of what happens after you die. But I think that for me, one of the dangerous parts of the series is that Hannah, the girl who takes her life, is back in flashbacks and is seeing the effect on her death of her death and talking to her classmates and being a part of the story. And in my mind, I don't know that that happens. And so I think that's one of the conversations parents need to have as well, that realizing that if you take your life, it doesn't mean you're here to see what happens after the fact. So just adding what Dr. Cha said. From, from, from a point. professional and as well from a, a survivor point of view, th this is the most important thing that I wanna tell people out there who even thinking about it. Suicide is nothing heroic and nothing romantic mm -hmm. about it at all. Nothing, period. Yeah. I, I don't know what else to say except for it's not romantic. It is not heroic. And and in 13 Reasons Why, um, as I recall from season one, Hannah, the main character, as we said, the, the girl who, who dies by suicide, her locker is decorated. You know, they make sort of a shrine around it. She gets mm -hmm. all sorts of attention um, that she didn't get in life. And it feels like to a, to a teenager who is looking to be liked and looking to be um, accepted and wanted, that's one way to gain it, it can feel like that's one way to gain the approval and the attention. Um, even if it's your death, you're going to get it. And, and that can be um, a very um, sad pull on, on the life of a, of a student, and especially those who are vulnerable to some of these um, other reasons that we talked about. So, um, Cheryl, you, you've mentioned at Teen Line that you have some resources, and I think you have a toolkit that might be something that would be good to be able to maybe share with the, the parents or the um, adults that are watching. Yeah, so definitely on our website, we wrote pretty extensively last year about the series. So there's information on our website, which I gave below. But what I am so thrilled about, there's an international coalition of experts um, that's created this amazing, amazing toolkit it, the website is live right now, and it's 13reasonswhytoolkit.org, and it has resources for parents, for educators, for youth, for media. It really captures everything that hopefully we're going to talk about and everything I really feel about the series. For educators, there's a letter to send out to the parents at the school because I think that's important as well, that parents get as much information as they can so that they can be this resource for their kids. Because I think that's really what happened last year. These kids were watching the show and parents really didn't know. And so these, a lot of these conversations weren't happening. So I'd love for us to get on top of it as much as possible this year. So and the thing cool. about that, if I, if I may, is that letter. I think as we are going into summer, because the series mm -hmm. is gonna overlap and go into summer, I think a responsible school uh, would be the one who actively, proactively sends that letter out to parents. I, I think alerting them that this that this resource is available correct. for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great. And then for the professional out there, the toolkit also include um, information and, and guidelines for professionals as well. The only thing that it didn't uh, uh, include, and I would hope that you would address it, Kay, is to the faith based healer because. Mm -hmm. We, we have to accept the fact that in most family, the first professional that they go to when they're in crisis, emotional crisis especially, is their faith-based healers or their faith-based leaders. So yeah. um, I was hoping that there was that segment in there for the faith-based healers, but it didn't. Yeah. Well, just um, to, to um, you know, segue, I mean, uh, keep going on that idea. I, I totally agree. And I'm so grateful that this toolkit is available. Cheryl, thank you so much for your team making that. Um, oh, I, I, wasn't in, I wasn't involved. I just know about it. So. Well, thank you for telling us about I'm, it. I'm grateful to all the people who did create it, too. I do, you know. So. But Dr. Chow, you bring up a really good point, is that sometimes in faith communities, um, we're hesitant um, to talk about some of the harder topics because, Maybe they don't. Maybe the the student leader themselves doesn't feel prepared. And here's an here's a, a resource that Cheryl, you're telling us exists to help train, um, uh, you know, student uh, youth leaders and adults and parents. But in the faith community, we can fill in some of those gaps um, because 
most churches or, or um, synagogues and even um, I know there's Muslim youth associations where you've got caring adults who are committed to working with students and children and who become part of that um, resource for a student, um, something, someone to turn to. And, um, and so to equip them with um, this knowledge and this information and um, is, is so helpful. And there is a role that the faith community can play that sometimes is underutilized, but we can definitely fill in those gaps. So if we've got, um, Dr. Chow, what, what's a good way to open a dialogue? It, let's just say this uh, a parent watches 13 Reasons, or maybe they don't, but, but they know that their student is interested or they're talking about, what are some good ways that you can open a dialogue about suicide with students? I think the most important question would be asking their feeling and asking whether or not they're thinking about suicide, right? I think there's a myth that if you talk about suicide or if you ask someone about suicide that they will carry out the act, which is not true at all. In fact, that's the best way to get someone to open up and honestly talk about their feeling and their action and what have you. So I think that's the number one important question that you could start. Just not be afraid to even ask the question. That's right. That's correct. That's Mm -hmm. correct. Cheryl, any, what else would you add with that? Yeah, I would definitely agree with Dr. Chow. And I think using natural occurrences as a segue into the conversation, whether it's a parent listening to this podcast, right, or this Facebook Live right now who later has a conversation with their child, hey, this is what I was talking about. Let's talk about it together and let's find out, you know, what what's your experience with suicide? Is this something that comes into your life with your friends? Or I think as much as, as scary as a topic is, and it's terrifying, but I think if we can demystify it and make it a word we're not scared to use and talk about things like depression or feeling sad and having resources, I think opening that dialogue is really is really key. And the parent, the child fe- or the teen feeling like their parents okay to talk about it. Because I think a lot of times, to Dr. Chow's point, we ask the question, well, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? In a way that makes them not feel comfortable or not open up. And I Unfortunately, I don't think by virtue of privilege or good grades or friends, we can think that our child is protected. Anyone can struggle. And so I think we'll we'll just be open board. We're going to talk about some warning signs um, next that parents, you know, might look for. So we'll come right back to that topic. But Dr. Chow, was there something else you were going to say? Um, in- no, no, I, I, I was agreeing with Cheryl that the most important thing for the parent is once you ask, um, you send a signal that it is okay for your child to have a discussion with you. That's the most important piece. I think the parents that I've talked to now through the years, especially since Matthew, um, since my son died, is the parents who are so afraid to not only ask the question because they just can't conceive that they're beautiful, you know, talented, particularly those that aren't showing any signs of mental illness. Maybe their student who um, is doing well in school and doing well in athletics and maybe has what they feel like is just a little blip on the screen. Maybe they see some changes in them, but they're so afraid to ask that question, not only because they don't want to entertain the reality that something really could be wrong, but I think even a greater fear is they don't know what to do if this, what if there's, what if their teen says, yes, I am, you know, yes, I have had those thoughts. Then I think parents freeze and feel like I would have no idea what to do. And so the the fear of not knowing where to go or what to what to do next actually I think can keep some parents from even asking that question. And and what I'm hearing you two say is that there are good resources, there are sources of information for parents so that parents can feel more confident in asking that very important question, are you thinking of suicide? Yes. So what are some signs? What if if uh, if parents did? How would how would they know? How do parents know the difference between their student is just going through a little bit of a rough time? Everybody goes through rough times. It's part of being human. How do you know that there's something that is actually a warning sign, Doctor Chow? What would you say? So the number one things are, are you you don't know what is normal changes in life, right? And 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 what are something that you need to look for, but. You don't have to wait until it's very severe or your child shows severe 
uh, a behavior in order for you to step in and assess it, right? It, it, you would hope that parents would always keep opposing the changes in their in, in their child. So think like if your child's getting more isolated, certainly uh, they don't want to do things with the family. They don't want to do things with friends. Uh, changes in mood, they get irritable very easily. Uh, changes in their sleeping pattern, changes in, the, in their eating pattern, right? Or they sometimes they would talk about ending life or talking about death. Uh, so those are some very concrete warning signs. Uh, substance abuse, that's the other, uh, the, uh, the other warning signs as well, right? Hanging around the wrong Increase friend. Increase in risky behavior. That's correct. Not wanting to go to school. Those are some important warning signs uh, that signal that you should have a conversation with your child about it. Cheryl, anything you would add to that? Yeah, no, I 100% agree. I would just add like a departure from the baseline, knowing what your kid, and I hate to use what normal, but what, you know, if you have a kid who's usually pretty quiet and doesn't have a ton of friends, it's not as alarming if that kid is keeping to themselves. But a kid who used to be really social and used to have a lot of friends, now all of a sudden is spending all their time alone. Or a kid who used to really care about school and now doesn't seem to care about school. Or same with appearance. They used to really care about their appearance. Now they don't. Or, you know, it's those kinds of things, dropping activities. Those things are really, to me, when warning signs come up as, you know, warning signs. Also, some of the comments they make. And, um, you know, just thinking that things are too hard or I can't take this anymore. What would it be like if I wasn't here? At least exploring what that means to the kid. And I think when you're talking, if you're asking if they're thinking about suicide, pointing to some of these concrete factors and saying, hey, I've noticed that you used to really be into school. And now it seems like your grades are falling and, you know, you don't seem to be sleeping enough and I'm concerned about you. So bringing it to real points of what you're seeing as well. And also sometimes realizing this isn't necessarily one day, that this is usually a pattern over time, that it's not your straight A student who gets an F on a test one day. That's right. definitely, you know, let's talk about this, see what's going on, but it might not be, It's uh, to me it's more worrisome when it's a pattern if, if over time. So, so if a parent starts seeing a change from the baseline, as you said, you know, and they, they know their child and their student is, just really some of those things are, are starting to happen and maybe they're starting to accumulate. There's four or five of those um, warning signs. What what's, should a parent do? I mean, we've talked about, yes, ask your student what they're thinking, what they're feeling, but from a, how do they get help? What's the first step maybe to get help? What, who should they see? Dr. Chow. Some would think that uh, uh, earlier you talk about parents afraid to ask questions because they don't know who to turn and where to turn. Actually, there's a lot of resources out there. And imagine as a parent, if you're afraid, your child is probably even more terrified and not knowing where to turn, right? And so um, um, uh, Cheryl mentioned the, the teen line, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that you will uh, share with us the teen line uh, phone number, Shell. Uh, but yeah, there's we'll a put that on the screen. We'll put that yeah. on the screen. There's a national hotline 800 273 talk. Uh, your local county uh, public health department or health department always have a mental health line for folks. Uh, in Orange County, we call it 211. Um, uh, uh, so there's resources out there. Uh, your insurance company, whoever the insurance care is, uh, has a line for mental health. And, and you need to be persistent. And I know sometimes parents said the system is very complicated to maneuver, uh, but you have to be persistent and you have to advocate for yourself, for your child, for your family and be persistent in it. I would, I, I would think probably even at just the, the very bottom rung of the ladder of getting help is seeing your pediatrician. That's what I was just gonna say, yeah, pediatrician or school counselor as well. Yeah, or your parent. What did you say, Cheryl? I'm sorry. I was going to say pediatrician and school counselor. I would add in yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Primary care physician. It's um, to bring them, bring the child there, and say, ask for an evaluation. You know, and then um, because sometimes parents are even daunted by calling hotlines, or, or but they do know they already have a, re a relationship established with a primary care physician. You know, hopefully, or a pediatrician, and and that feels like maybe a safe place to actually start with. You know, getting help. So what about, what can we do on the proactive side of, of building resilience in, in students? What can parents and teachers and, and youth do that will actually 
um, start to build resilience. And by res please define resilience. Dr. Chow, what, define resilience for us. What are we even talking about when we say we need to build resilience in students? Okay, do you mind if I go back to one oh, quick thing? Please do. please do, Cheryl. Okay, well, I, was, so. I was just going to say, in an ideal world, I'm a parent myself. In an ideal world, we all want our kids to talk to us. We want to be their trusted confidant. But maybe for whatever reason, we're not. They don't yeah. feel comfortable talking to us. I think it's important to put our own feelings aside and make sure they have some adult that they could talk to, that's whether right. it's a face person, a teacher, another family member. I think that's a disservice sometimes when we, you know, we don't provide them another trusted adult because we so want it to be us. So I just that's wanted to. A really, get that's a really good point. That really is. And and even our pride can can keep. Right. Our, yeah, you know, we don't. We like you say, we want to be the one that's that's their their trusted confidant. But right. you know, their grandma or their aunt or right. next door neighbor or some a coach or something. Go ahead, Dr. Chow. Well, the, well, I think the important point for parents is that sometimes parents get to that point and not reaching out is because they feel like they are alone. Mm -hmm. You you are not alone. This happened to a lot of family, and so reach out and and get connected is the most important thing that you could do as a parent. Absolutely. So, so resilience. So you asked me what is the definition? Yeah, just yeah, sorry, sorry, I interrupted. Uh, no, no, I'm so glad no, you said that. Sorry. Really important point. Um, I just think, yeah, that I think American Psychological Association definition of what resilient is. So it's a process. That's the important piece, right? It's a process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress, uh, such as family and relationship problems, serious health problems, or workplace and financial stressor. So it means bouncing back from difficult experiences, right? So there are various strategy in building resilience, and some of them are making connection back to what we just talking earlier, whether or not your parents or a child is making connection to people in your family, to your friends, to your faith community, to your community at large, right? Um, a voicing crisis as something that you can surpass. Um, that, that that is not true at all, and 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 you can do that by put, putting things in perspective, right? There's always putting there's always uh, um, uh, opportunity for you uh, to move forward with your goals. That's important piece, and and it's hard at time when you're at that moment of thinking about suicide. Uh, take decisive uh, uh, action, like um, rather than uh, detaching from the problem, detaching your family, you need to uh, reach out, right? And don't wish that thing would go away. You have to take actions about it to change your life circumstances. Uh, and, and then that brings back to the issue of accepting that change is a part of living. That's part of life, all right? Uh, the other thing about resilience is, is maintain a hopeful outlook, and that's very important. And as parents, that's the most important thing that you could give to your child mm -hmm. is maintain that stance of hopeful, despite of what family situation you're going through, okay? And then taking care of yourself is very, very important, whether it be exercise, eating, or sleeping well. So those are some of the uh, ways that you can build resilience. And resilience, um, as as you said, is is what that they've identified as being one. I mean, they meaning researchers and and uh, scientists have have identified as what can make the difference between someone who faces a very difficult, challenging life circumstance and thrives or learns how to thrive, and those who may crumble or who find um, who find that their lives kind of fall apart is is that it's resilience and. I, I, I like the fact that um, it's something that can be taught. You know, Cheryl, you, you must, you know, working with teens all the time, sometimes teens have the idea, well, somebody else, they can do it because they're better than, than I am. And, and if I were like them, I could, I could have survived that better. But, but actually resilience um, training says that, that we can actually pass those skills on. How have, you, how have you found that, you know, through your work with teens? Well, I think I, I was just thinking from a parent perspective, I think as, as a parent, the hardest thing is seeing your child in pain or seeing your child struggling or seeing your child sad. So I think it's natural. We try to take that away from them. We try to fix it. We try to make it better. We try to, you know, I don't want to say sugarcoat because that's not really the word, but we don't always let teens go through the difficult emotions of life. 
And I think as parents, we do need to let them sometimes feel bad or sometimes things didn't go their way or sometimes this is sad. We need to definitely be there for them through that experience and then hopefully take that experience of what we can grow from it. Um, and so the next time a situation comes our way, we can handle it differently. Because I think, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of teens who don't have a lot of coping skills, who don't really know how to deal with adversity. And we're seeing it play out of a lot of kids going off to college and falling apart, for lack of a better word, because um, they haven't really learned how to deal with life's up and down. So I think that's definitely a gift we can give to our children and helping them become more independent, making, you know, making mistakes and supporting them through the through our mistakes, I think is huge. And as Dr. Chow said, role modeling ourselves, how we deal with stressful situations, how we come back, how we take care of ourselves so that our kids see us, you know, us doing this as well. So, I mean, so, go ahead, Dr. Okay. Chow. So the two words that you said that are very important, Chow, and, 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 and those are be there, right? Whether mm -hmm. it be a parent or a a friend, uh, when you encounter someone in crisis, what you need to do is just be there for them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people in crisis seem like they're alone and nobody's there for them. And be there meaning just listen, don't be judgmental, right? And 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 whatever that they say, make sure that you repeat it and 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 and, and so that they know that you truly understand how they feel. Uh, and then mm -hmm. together find solutions, seek help. Etc. Um, thank you. I would. I'm, I'm reading a book right now called I Gen. I mm, like I yes. yes by Jean Twenge, and I, it is blowing me away. Um, keying back on something you had said, Cheryl, um, of of how kids are not necessarily prepared. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, and this book really point. I really highly recommend this book for um, parents, for student leaders, for educators. Teachers again. It's iGen by um, Dr. Jean Twenge. Aunt Twenge. I never say her name right. Um, but she talks about how the how social media, how how the internet, how the use actually of of iPhones or cell phones, um, and the more universal um, adaptation of that that they're in the hands of almost everyone, and how they can track how that has changed the next generation. This is the first generation of, of um, human beings actually who have never known a world without the internet, without that kind of technology and how that has obviously a lot of positives, but some very negative things or some things that we're gonna have to learn how to cope with differently, how these students are coming into adulthood in a very different pattern from the generation before them, the millennials, the, the Gen Xers. And uh, you mentioned about you know them not being really Prepared. So if social media is one of those things that, um, that Dr. Twenge talks about has negatively affected particularly girls um, and how that, that studies are starting to show that an increase in depression and even suicide uh, among girls and they're linking some of that more and more to social media. So how can parents stay involved and engaged in their, in their students' social media and what are some ways that we can keep them safe? Either of you, whichever what whichever of you wants to dive into that first. Great show. Go yeah, I, was gonna say, I love that. But I Jen, I've actually seen her speak as well, and she's amazing. Am I saying her name correctly? I don't remember. I feel like I, it's I don't, a hard, but it's spelled in an unusual way, and I'm taking a good stab at it. I don't remember. I would also recommend. I will answer your question: How to Raise an Adult by Julie Lithcott Hames. Great. That's a really amazing book that really talks about building resilience in our kids and how to take a step back and have them be, like I said, how to raise an adult, how to have them be, you know, capable adults. Um, but to answer your question on social media, I think social media can be amazing. I mean, for the, you know, gay kid in a small town in Iowa who may not have anyone he can talk to about what's going on, he may find a message board on a site that literally saves his life. So I think there's a lot of power for good. That being said, there's a lot of power not so good as well. And as you said, girls, I think, are particularly susceptible to it. I think going back to teens don't always know the line between reality and what they see on the screen. So I think having those conversations, I mean, I'll admit as an adult, sometimes Facebook induced depression where I see, you know, and I'm using that colloquially, colloquially 
um, where I see my friends and, you know, wow, their life looks so great. I'm just sitting here at my desk. I think I have the adult perspective to know, right. yeah, but they had a fight with their husband 10 minutes before right. and now they're posting this perfect picture. Everything's not so perfect. I think teens don't have that perspective. And so I think it's really dangerous. They see a picture of their friend looking super happy and think, why is that not me? So I think as parents having some of those conversations about the difference between what you see online versus what is, what's, you know, what is real and times that they might have posted something that was very different from what they were experiencing, what they were feeling as well. Um, I think I don't necessarily believe in, um, you know, all the tracking and the apps and hiding it. Cause I think teens, as we said before, can be crafty. And the more we try to, you know, track what they're doing or monitor them, I think the more secretive they can get. Um, I, and I just, younger kids, I think maybe there's a place for it. As they get older, I think it's teaching them how to manage it, teaching them how to take breaks from it, maybe not sleeping with their phones in their rooms, taking time to actually, you know, look up and have face-to-face -face conversations. Right. And just, you know, like I said, open dialogue about everything, about what they're seeing, what they're feeling, what they're doing, and even sharing Dr. Twinge, which I'm gonna butcher her name too, talks about sharing some of these results from her book with the teens. Because yes. it really blows their mind sometimes to realize what effect it might be having on their brain. So I think having that dialogue, teens like information, they don't like lectures, but if you can show them a research study, they actually might respond to it or might resonate with it as well. Yeah, Dr. Chow, any any, what would you add to that? So, so I, I would agree with uh, uh, Cheryl. I think that social media is amazing. Um, think back of when we were young, uh, it was very difficult to connect to the world and the community, right? And information is now readily available, especially for uh, kids who are isolated in small town or in a different country uh, who really have little access to social services and what have you. So I think it's good that the, the downside about social media um, is that uh, it defines what perfect perfection is uh, to beauty, uh, what, what is beauty and what have you. And, and it set an unrealistic standard for uh, our, our community for our, our, our human race, because our, our, our race is very diverse and our community is very diverse, right? So, uh, but but it created an opportunity for leaders that like yourself uh, to use it as a forum to outreach to kids, to youngster, and many other uh, to talk about openly about some of this issue, like right. suicide, um, uh, poverty and what have you, and really send a message of hope uh, to the youngster that everybody is talking about is everyone is aware and you don't have to fit certain mold, certain standard, uh, uh, but just be who you are uh, and, and, and create that connection all over the world. I think that's what social media has afforded us to do. So uh, take, yeah. take it as an opportunity uh, to teach and to engage youngster. Sure. Yeah. I would say as parents too, to monitor our own social media and our own phone use. I know I'm horribly guilty of that, but put down our phones when our kids want to talk to us, have cell phone free times where we're actually, you know, all looking at each other. And like I said, um, modeling those breaks for them too. I mean, if we put our phones as more important than our kids, then of course they're going to do it as well. They're looking, you know, they're looking to us as well. And so monitoring some of our time on social media as well, because we are their teachers and guides and maybe sharing some of those feelings like i said of the story i told of you know seeing the friend knowing that isn't perfection sharing some of that and having those dialogues well thank you both so much um is there any are there any last words particularly around 13 reasons if somebody's come in you know to the conversation late is there anything about 13 reasons why um that we want to let's talk you know again put the we'll have the um toolkit um, information available and the hot, both the hotlines, the suicide prevention hotline and the teen line. Um, and then uh, thank you both for being with us. I think for parents or student uh, leaders who happen to be watching educators, um, I think what we want to leave you with today is just the incredible role of caring adults in the lives of teenagers and that each of us really can make a difference um, for a particular student being there when they come to us, not being afraid to ask questions, not being afraid to bring up topics. And then at the very end of that day, making that eye contact, making sure that they know that they don't need to feel alone, that they may be struggling, but we're with them. 
We're going to help them get the help that they need. We're in it together. And I think that when that becomes the message we give to students and to teenagers, we actually really can be a part of saving lives. So thank you both so much, Cheryl, Dr. Chow. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much.